Today, crunch time approaches. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And just before we start, a quick reminder that at 8pm Sydney time tonight, you can join us for our live stream. This week, I'm joined by Damien Klassen from Nucleus Wealth and Walk the World Funds. And we're going to be talking about the latest in the investment markets. And you can ask a question live. Well, we're coming to the pointy end of the action now, with the Nasdaq closing lower on Monday after a choppy session for US equities ahead of a big week of technology earnings reports while oil prices rose and Treasury yields edged higher as investors braced for a Federal Reserve interest rate hike. The S&P 500 seesawed on Monday and ended close to unchanged. And meanwhile, in Australia, the head of APRA, the entity responsible for banking supervision, is going while the local bond market is in pieces. In currencies, the dollar index, which touched a 20-year high this month, was down slightly, and gold also slipped a bit, as did Bitcoin. Concerns that rising interest rates will drive the economy into a recession has been escalating as the Fed tightens monetary policy aggressively to bring down the steepest inflation in four decades. Fed Chair Jerome Powell has said that failing to restore price stability would be, quote, a bigger mistake than pushing the US into a recession, which he's continued to maintain the nation can avoid. Powell and his colleagues are expected to approve another 75 basis point hike this week after raising rates in June by the most since 1994. Policymakers are expected to signal their intention to keep moving higher in the months ahead. And if they do go 75 basis points at the end of their two-day monetary policy meeting on Wednesday, that would effectively end pandemic-era support for the US economy. Comments by Fed Chair Jerome Powell following the announcement will also be key, of course, as some investors worry that aggressive rate hikes could tip the US economy into recession. Economist Narelle Rubindi said the US is facing a deep recession as interest rates rise and the economy is burdened by high debt loads, calling those expecting a shallow downturn, quote, delusional. There are many reasons why are we going to have a severe recession and a severe debt and financial crisis? The idea that this is going to be short and shallow is totally delusional. Among the reasons Rubini cited was historically high debt ratios in the wake of the pandemic, and he specifically mentioned the burden for advanced economies, which he said continues to rise, as well as in some subsectors. That differs from the 1970s, he said, when the debt ratio was low despite the combination of stagnant growth and high inflation, known as stagflation. But the nation's debt has ballooned since the financial crisis of 2008, which was followed by low inflation or deflation due to a credit crunch and demand shock, he added. This time we have stagflationary negative aggregate supply shocks and debt ratios that are historically high said Rubini, who, by the way, is nicknamed Dr. Doom for some of his dire predictions. In previous recessions, like the last two, we had massive monetary and fiscal easing. This time around, we are going into a recession by tightening monetary policy. We have no fiscal space. This time around, we have a confluence of stagflation and of a severe debt crisis, he said. So it will be worse than the 70s and post-GFC. But hey, on Sunday, US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that while US economic growth was slowing, a recession was not inevitable. And President Joe Biden's administration is downplaying data due this week that could show the US economy contracted for a second straight quarter, a development that would match one standard definition of a recession. The administration's message, what's often called a technical recession, isn't necessarily a real one. At stake is winning a political messaging battle with Republicans over how effective Biden's policies have been in spurring a post-pandemic recovery. Biden's aides, including Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, have fanned out in recent days in preparation for Thursday's quarterly gross domestic product data, explaining that the formal definition of a recession is complex and runs deeper than simply two quarters of negative growth. The president himself said, we're not going to be in a recession, in my view, 
speaking to reporters on Monday. My hope is we go from this rapid growth to steady growth, Biden said, while noting that the US unemployment rate was 3.6%, and that's historically low. Administration officials argue that the current economic picture is complicated, with global supply shocks and fluctuating commodity prices offset by a robust labour market. The US added more than a million jobs in the second quarter, National Economic Council Director Brian Deese highlighted on Monday. There's never been a US recession where the economy didn't lose jobs, he said. We face an economy with very significant global challenges, Deese added in an interview. Our focus is on what we can do on policy to try to address these challenges and how then to try to increase the prospects that we can move through the process, this period of uncertainty, to a period of more stable, steady growth. The median forecast for second quarter GDP is for a 0.4% annualised gain following a 1.6% contraction in the first three months of the year. But 20 of 63 economists currently expect a drop, helping fuel the recession debate. With growth tracking very low this quarter, there is elevated risk that second quarter 2022 GDP is negative and marks a technical recession in the first half of 2022, Morgan Stanley economists wrote in a July note. Biden's team is drawing a distinction between what's officially regarded as a recession and what's generally referred to as a technical recession. The colloquial definition is a sort of shorthand to two consecutive quarters of negative growth, but the formal definition in the US context comes from the National Bureau of Economic Research, which defines a recession as a significant decline in economic activity that is spread across the economy and that lasts more than a few months. A dedicated NBER panel bases the termination on criteria including the depth, diffusion and duration. So Deese took issue with the characterization of two quarters of GDP declines as a technical recession, terminology that's used widely by economists and investors alike. The technical definition is not two negative quarters, Deese said technically. The definition is the NBER's definition. And Yellen said on Sunday that she'd be amazed if the NBER calls this a recession, given the state of the labour market. When you're creating almost 400,000 jobs a month, that is not a recession, she said. The first quarter drop in GDP was largely due to a widening trade deficit that was spurred by a wave of imports and consumers spending continued alongside job growth in that period. It's entirely possible that we see a negative GDP print marking a technical recession, GDP also fell in the first quarter, even as the US economy is still showing underlying strength and inflation is accelerating, Wells Fargo strategist Eric Nielsen wrote in a research note on Friday. If a technical recession doesn't immediately mean a formal one, the data could still turn sour soon. And the Federal Reserve is poised, of course, to hike that 75 basis point rate this week, putting fresh pressure on growth in a bid to stem price increases. You don't see any of the signs now. A recession is a broad-based contraction that affects many sectors of the economy. We just don't have that, Yellen said. But inflation is way too high. And you know the Fed is charged with putting in place policies that will bring inflation down, and I expect them to be successful. Anyhow, Treasury yields edged higher, actually, as investors brace for the Fed to raise rates by unexpected 75 basis points this week. Some are worried about the potential for recession. Investors were also positioned ahead of earnings from big companies such as Apple, Microsoft and Amazon, as well as second quarter GDP data. Right now, we're just in a holding pattern, waiting for all of those developments to play out, said Michael O'Rourke, chief market strategist at Jones Trading at Stamford, Connecticut. People are probably just taking some risk off ahead of the earnings. We've seen interest rates rise a little too, so that's helping some of the value names like banks. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.28% to 31,990. The S&P 500 gained 0.13% to 3,966. And the Nasdaq Composite dropped 0.43% to 11,782. Earlier, a widely watched survey that showed German business morale was falling more than expected in July, thanks to high energy prices and looming gas shortages, which pushed Europe's largest economy towards a recession. The German data had weighed on investor moods in Europe, along with a slow of downbeat earnings, and a survey over the weekend that showed some industrial companies in Germany were cutting production in reaction to soaring energy prices. The benchmark 10-year note 
was at 2.787, while the two-year note was at 3%. The gap between yields on two- and ten-year Treasury notes is a possible signal of a looming recession when the short end yield is higher than the long end, which has been inverted now for more than two weeks. This is the first meaningful yield curve inversion we've seen since 2006 for any period, said David Petro Sinili, senior trader at InspireX, adding that this did feed into a generally accepted narrative of a slowdown at the very least. The dollar index fell 0.1% to 10638 and the euro was up 0.1% to 1.0230. The Japanese yen weakened 0.25% versus the greenback to 136.34, while sterling was up 0.16% to 1.2062. Pre-Fed caution is keeping the dollar off its highs. The market is going to be eager to see if the run of softer data has in any way changed the Fed's hawkish rate path, said Joe Maninbo senior market analyst at Western Union Business Solutions in Washington. The economy continues to show pretty solid underlying momentum, but at the same time, high inflation, rising interest rates, they're certainly having an impact on the economy. Oil prices were bolstered by a slightly weaker US dollar, while investors seesawed between supply fears and bets that rising US interest rates could weaken demand. In fact, US crude settled down 0.69% at 96.03 per barrel and Brent finished at 99.51 on the day. Spot gold was up slightly to 1,719 an ounce as investors positioned themselves ahead of the Fed meeting. Bitcoin fell 5.65% to 21,043 at last time I checked. Meantime, as reported in Bloomberg, Australia's bond markets are suffering from poor liquidity that's exacerbating price swings, leaving them more vulnerable to turmoil around Wednesday's crucial inflation report. Turnover in government debt has dropped to the lowest since 2019, even though the market has expanded by more than 50%. Some bank bill futures were also seeing a squeeze, according to Michael Grosser, head of trading at Commonwealth Bank of Australia, with bids and offers coming at 100 lots or less, down from as much as 3,000 lots a year ago. The dearth of liquidity reflecting tighter regulation that sapped the appetite for market makers is worsening the stress caused by global gyrations. The nation's $1 trillion general government debt market has been racked by bouts of volatility since last October when a stronger than expected inflation report caused bonds to tumble and pushed the Reserve Bank of Australia to scrap its yield curve control program. Three-year bond futures are seeing the most severe 30-day price swings since 2011, and Australia's yield curve may be on its way to an inversion, with the spread between the 3- and 10-year notes narrowing as quickening inflation prompts the central bank to tighten policy more. Bond investors face a nervous week, as with Australia reporting second-quarter consumer price index figures on July the 27th, and the trimmed mean measure surged to an annual pace of 3.7% last quarter. That's the third straight release where the data came in above all economists' estimates. Australia's bond markets have also been hit by a fallout from the Bank of Japan's uber dovish policy at a time when most of its peers are hiking rates to curb inflation. That divergence has driven the yen to 24-year lows and also sent costs soaring to hedge against a reversal of that drop. Australian 10-year yields are sitting near the highest since 2014 on a nominal basis, but when hedged into yen, that flips to minus 0.6%, helping drive some of the world's deepest pocket investors away from a market they traditionally favoured. Japanese investors have been net sellers, and that's definitely something that hasn't helped liquidity, Grosser said. And last time I looked, the Aussie was at 69.53. But finally... APRA Chair Wayne Byers advised the Governor-General that he intends to stand down as Chair of APRA, effective from the 30th of October 2022. He says the financial system is stable and APRA's leadership team is strong and the organisation's people are well placed to continue to manage future challenges. Against that backdrop, he says, I feel that now is a good time to hand over the Chair's role to someone new who will lead the organisation on the next stage of its journey. Just as we expect the financial institutions we regulate to carefully consider how they renew their leadership, the same applies to APRA. And it's been a difficult decision to make, but there is much about APRA that I'll miss. But after eight years as chair, I believe the time is right. I have every confidence the organisation will continue to do great things for the Australian community. 
Now, given the massive swing in mortgage rates and the pressure on households and indirectly on the banks, this is interesting timing. I guess we'll see in the months ahead whether the supervision under buyers has been appropriate. But with around 40% of households or so with little buffers, we will soon see who is wearing a cosy and who's not. And funnily enough, accountability once again may well be going by the board. And I think ahead what we're going to see is more volatility, more uncertainty as the markets try and work out what's going on with inflation. I do expect the Federal Reserve to be significantly raising rates and that's going to have a significant impact on the market. But I think ahead, the big question, of course, is whether a recession is coming or not. I tend to believe that the lines are now being drawn in the sand for a recession. And the question then becomes how deep and how long it is. And that, of course, in turn will determine the future path of interest rates. But in the short term, central banks are absolutely fixated on trying to squash inflation. The question, of course, will be, will they be successful? Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high, price discovery and price transparency are hard to find, and then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.